At the end of my RTK GPS video, I mentioned that I would return to the topic to test low, medium, and high-end GNSS receivers under varying conditions. Well, six months later, I finally got around to it, so get ready to find out if a $2,600 AMLED RS2 can outperform a $20,000 Trimble R12i. In the following testing scheme that I set up, I tested three different base rover pairs, Trimble's R12i, Spectra's SP80, and Emlid's RS2+. A typical listing price for a new pair of R12i's are about $40,000 plus, depending where you buy it from. The SP80 sells for around $30,000 per pair, and the RS2 Plus comes in at around $5,000 for a base rover combo. Going into this test, if you asked me what I expected to see in terms of an accuracy comparison, I would have tiered the receivers in the same order as what they cost. I would expect the R12s to be about as twice as accurate as the RS2 with the SP80s being somewhere in the middle. I don't want to spoil the surprise, but for now I'll just say the Emlet exceeded my expectations. So what parameters of a GNSS receiver affect its accuracy capabilities? GNSS receivers use data channels to manage the information sent by the GNSS satellites. Each channel receives a signal from a specific satellite in a specific constellation. Each satellite sends not only one signal, but several signals at different frequencies. Some manufacturers that have fewer channels built into the receivers make the argument that since we can only see approximately a maximum of 40 satellites at a given place on Earth at a given time, and those satellites are transmitting around five signals or less currently, that there is no need for more than 200 channels, and providing more is a marketing tactic used by other manufacturers that do offer more channels. Other manufacturers claim that they assign multiple channels per signal, for added redundancy and reliability, and that doing so can reduce time to fix and increase accuracy, especially in poor conditions. Also that some of the extra channels are assigned for interference detection. So do more channels truly mean a more accurate result? The answer to this will depend on who you ask. As more satellites are launched every year, and as new signals are being introduced, one could make the argument that those extra channels may have more use in the future than they do today, and that more channels certainly won't lessen the receiver's accuracy. For frame of reference, the R12s have 672 channels, the SP80s have 240, and the RS2s have 184. Most modern receivers, and all three included in this test, were capable of tracking all available satellite constellations in the test area used for RTK positioning, namely GPS, GLONASS, Galileo, and Beidou. According to Trimble's R12 spec sheet, it is capable of receiving five signals from GPS and GLONASS and Galileo, and six from Beidou. The SP80 is capable of receiving five from GPS and GLONASS, three from Galileo, and two from Beidou. And the RS2 is capable of receiving two from GPS, GLONASS, and Beidou, and three from Galileo. An anomaly that I noticed on the RS2 is that on the receiver head, L5 is noted. However, from the digging I did, it appears that the RS2 is not capable of receiving an L5 signal. It is much more difficult to quantify which receiver would have a true advantage over another when it comes to the receiver's processing algorithm, as we aren't given much information on exactly how the receivers are deriving the final coordinates differently than their competition in this respect. You can look up the advertising material for each and draw some conclusions from that, but again, your answer to which is best would depend on who you ask. The test site has eight designated check shots that are part of a control network that I set up using over 1,600 conventional total station measurements with an extremely high level of redundant measurements in the network. The error propagation of each check shot showed a 95% confidence of each error ellipse of better than eight thousandths of a foot or three millimeters horizontally in the semi-major axis and five thousandths of a foot or two millimeters vertically. The base point used for each receiver was on the west edge of the site 
with the longest baseline being 220 feet. Two of the eight check shots had a fairly clear view of the sky in what I labeled the unobstructed check shots. Three had a semi-obstructed view of the sky, which under normal circumstances, I would start to worry about my measured coordinates of these shots. And the last three of the eight had a nearly fully obstructed view of the sky. These represent GNSS conditions that should be avoided whenever possible. However, a lot of newer RTK marketing material is focused around the assertion that a manufacturer's newest receiver is now capable of accurate results under such conditions. Each round of observations included one 30 second measurement at each check shot with each receiver. This was repeated three times over three different days at three different times in each day. For example, Friday evening was the first round of observations for all three receivers, then Saturday morning was the second round, and Sunday afternoon was the final round. Each round consisted of eight check shots measured once per receiver for a total of 24 measurements per receiver over the entire testing period and 72 measurements total between all three receivers. To ensure fair and consistent testing, I used the same rod and bipod for every measurement and the rod level bubble was calibrated prior to starting the test. Every observation was limited to 30 seconds while the data collector read there was a fixed solution, if a fixed solution was obtainable. I set up over the check shot, waited for the precision to stabilize for a maximum of two minutes, and then took a 30 second, 30 measurement observation. Each receiver was tested immediately one after another for each round of observations to ensure similar satellite geometry and similar atmospheric conditions. If fix was not obtainable after waiting for two minutes, the observation was still taken but was pulled from the statistical analysis. The R12 wasn't able to reduce its precision to an acceptable level on one observation, and the SP80 failed to obtain fix on two observations. The RS2 had no issues obtaining fix within the two minute time limit throughout the entire testing scheme. I broke up the results into four different graphs, two of which showed the combined horizontal and vertical average residuals of each receiver on the y-axis and the data separated into the three obstruction categories on the x-axis. This should give a glimpse into the overall performance of a receiver based on the local GNSS conditions. The other two graphs showed the maximum horizontal and vertical residuals separated into the same three obstruction categories. This could be used as a level of trust that one could expect. The R12 had an average horizontal residual of 21 thousandths of a foot for the unobstructed points, where the SP80 showed 29 thousandths of a foot and the RS2 showed 30 thousandths of a foot. For the same points, the R12 showed a maximum horizontal residual of 43 thousandths of a foot the SP80 had 68 thousandths of a foot, and the RS2 had 74 thousandths of a foot. So far, the results are about what I expected to see before I began testing. When we look at the average vertical residuals for the same points, the R12 had an average residual of 50 thousandths of a foot, and the SP80 was significantly less at 37 thousandths of a foot, and the RS2 had the largest average vertical residual of 85 thousandths of a foot. And for the same points, the R12 showed a maximum vertical residual of 0.123 feet, the SP80 also had 0.123 feet, and the RS2 had 0.131 feet. When we look at the semi-obstructed points, the average horizontal residuals follow a similar trend with the R12 at 0.041 feet and the SP80 and the RS2 both at 0.043 feet. Although this time the values were much closer together with no obvious winner here. When we look at the maximum horizontal residuals for the same points, the R12 actually got beat out by the SP80 for the second time with a maximum horizontal residual of 0.084 feet where the SP80 had a maximum horizontal residual of 0.078 feet. 
and the RS2 again trailed in last place at 0.090 feet. For the vertical component, the R12 had an average residual of 0.110 feet and a max of 0.203 feet. The SP80 had an average vertical residual of 0.068 and a max of 0.151. And the RS2 had an average vertical residual of 0.076 and a max of 0.230. This was the first time the RS2 didn't come in last place, beating out the R12, and the SP80 was significantly more accurate in the vertical component compared to the R12. The SP80 performed exceptionally poor on all fully obstructed check shots, especially a point near a metal roof. An interesting thing to note was the first time I measured that point with the SP80, the data collector read that it had a fixed RTK position and the precision wasn't too bad considering the conditions, but the derived coordinate was over six feet out in all three axes. Some refer to this situation as a false fix. I've seen it before, but it's usually pretty rare, and I actually talk about a situation I saw it at the end of my RTK GPS accuracy video. Even though you have a fixed solution, that doesn't mean you can entirely trust the resulting coordinates with RTK, especially in poor GNSS conditions. This is one reason it's extremely important to take multiple observations under differing satellite geometry to any points that require a moderate to high level of accuracy and confidence. The R12 performed between two to four times better than the RS2 in all four different aspects of this test. Horizontally, the R12 performed significantly better in good conditions, about the same in okay conditions, and much better in poor conditions. Vertically, the SP80 performed the best until it came to poor conditions where it fell apart. The RS2 tended to do the worst except in poor conditions where it beat out the SP80, but it was no match for the R12. While the RS2 didn't do quite as well as the R12, it was actually closer than I thought it was going to be, and it actually beat the SP80s in some tests. Could I have altered my capture techniques with the RS2 to beat the accuracy of the R12 and the SP80? Absolutely I could. It would just take more time in the field. Remember, when it comes to random error, more observations equal better accuracy. The R12 does still have a very obvious advantage in poor GNSS conditions. Obviously, it doesn't only come down to accuracy when choosing which receiver to buy. But if I was starting a new company and had a budget of, say, $50,000 for tools, I could either get a pair of R12s and a data collector, or instead buy a pair of RS2s, a used total station, some processing software, and have money left over for a work truck. If I did a lot of bush work or was with a company that was much more established with a better budget, now I would be leaning towards the R12s. The SP80s are slow to fix, use data broadcast formats, struggle a lot in poor conditions, and don't have an option for IMU-enabled tilt correction. If you can get them for a good price used, it may be a good option, but for their list price, which isn't far off of an R12i, I would personally pass. Just to clear things up, the SP80 having better average vertical residuals for the unobstructed points doesn't mean that the SP80 is better than the R12 vertically. The sample size of data, while much better than the vast majority of YouTube RTK accuracy comparisons, is just not large enough to draw those kinds of conclusions. To do that, I would have had to repeat this test every day for several months. However, there are some conclusions I can make with a fair degree of confidence from this testing scheme. I would expect the horizontal and vertical accuracy of all three receivers tested to be fairly similar for unobstructed and semi-obstructed observations. And the R12 and the RS2 had a superior time to fix compared to the SP80s. To be honest, I was kind of surprised the R12 didn't do better for the unobstructed and semi-obstructed tests, especially in the vertical component of the semi-obstructed test. When you look closer at the data, there were no shifts, no rotations, no real trends in the data that could have been explained with some kind of systematic error. There was just a lot of random error floating around. The whole point of this video is to try and figure out which receiver was the most accurate and if the cost differential between receivers could be explained 
by significantly better performance by the higher end units. If I'm being 100% transparent, I came into this test selfishly wanting the MLIT RS2 to fail. We surveyors have enjoyed a barrier of entry for competition via cost of equipment for quite some time. Whenever a member of the public sees a surveyor working on the street, they inevitably ask two questions. Is that a camera? And how much did that piece of equipment cost? Our surveying tools are notorious for being extremely expensive and have been for the last several hundred years until very recently. Amlid and other offshore brands are starting to change that. For better or for worse, the cost of equipment barrier to entry is shrinking day by day. Just owning expensive equipment and providing the service of surveying will no longer be good enough. As competition increases, the surveyors that last will do so in part by being more skilled and knowledgeable than their competition. Continuing education has never been as important in our career as it is today. I will have a follow-up to this video in the not-so-distant future where I test Trimble's RTX satellite-based correction service against public RTK and RTN correction services using cores and we'll take a look at how they compare to the results we found today using a local base. So stay tuned and thank you for spending some of your valuable time with me today and as always subscribe if you want, like if you feel it's warranted, and I'll see you next time.